Hello, and welcome to Spectacular Specimens. My name is Dr. Katherine O'Brien. I work for the Museum of Biological Diversity at The Ohio State University. I am one of the scientists who collaborates with the Grandview Heights Public Library to create the Natural Wonders mobile museum kiosks that you can see in the library foyers. Every week this summer, we are going to be showing you an exciting specimen from the museum's collections. Library staff have added links to ebooks that you can download from the library. You can see the link in the description below. This week, we're going to be learning more about the oceans and exploring the oceans with Meg Daly and Heather Galan. I'm Meg Daly. I'm a professor at Ohio State, and I teach evolutionary biology, marine biology, and organismal diversity. In my lab, we study sea anemones. Sea anemones don't look like animals because they don't have an obvious head or an obvious front side. They don't act like animals because they basically don't move as adults. But sea anemones are animals. Sea anemones are cnidarians. You may be familiar with corals or jellyfish. Those are cnidarians too. All of these animals have teeny tiny things called nematocysts in their body, and they use these to capture food or fight off predators. The nematocysts are microscopic, sharp, and coated with toxins. When it is hunting or defending itself, the cnidarian causes the little sharp bit of the nematocyst to pop out. You can see the nematocyst capsules poking out of the, the cnidarian tentacle here. These little things are invisible to the eye, and the venom inside of them are what makes a jellyfish sting hurt. Cnidarians are an ancient group of animals. They split off from the rest of the animal tree about 800 million years ago. This means that cnidarians have survived all of the mass extinctions on Earth. This fossil cnidarian, called a horn coral, is extinct now, but was common during the Devonian about 400 million years ago. Horn coral fossils can be found in Ohio, especially in Devonian age formations near Cincinnati. My name is Heather Glon, and I have been studying sea anemones in the Daily Lab for the past four years as a PhD student. Sea anemones are certainly amazing animals to see, and there are several things about them that make them attractive to use in research. They are relatively very simple animals, but at the same time, they have so many unique things about them, from their wide range of color and color pattern, their venom, to all the different ways they can reproduce, like cloning themselves. Um, they also have hugely diverse size and shapes that are found throughout the ocean. Though they're animals, they just don't move around much, so they're super easy to collect in the field, and they definitely don't seasonally migrate like birds or whales, and so we don't have to chase them down either. We also get to travel to a, a lot of really cool places since they live literally anywhere in the ocean, from the polar regions to tropical areas and even brackish bodies of water along the coast. Their ability to survive through time despite changes in climate, as well as their sensitivity to changes in the environment, make them easy to use as a model organism in research. One sea anemone, Aptasia, is commonly used as a model to understand the much more sensitive corals in coral reefs, since anemones are much easier to keep in the lab and grow a lot more quickly in aquaria. We can even study different plants and animals that they interact with. Since many anemones have symbiotic relationships with another organism, so they both can benefit from the presence of the other individual. One of the most common symbiotic relationships that people know about in sea anemones is the one that was featured in the popular movie Finding Nemo. These clownfish hosting sea anemones are only found in the warm tropical water where they can get plenty of sun. Of course, other sea anemones also provide a home for other animals like shrimp and other small crustaceans too. And like corals, many warm water sea anemones have relationships with tiny little algae called zooxanthellae that help give them both their bright colors and also food from sunlight. Because a lot of the tropical species of sea anemones need light to get plenty of food, many people find sea anemones in the shallow water while they're snorkeling or scuba diving in the tropics. In the warm water, we see some pretty sneaky adaptations of sea anemones, especially since so many of them prefer to be more active at night to escape predators. One sea anemone, Labrunia neglecta, shows only its pseudotentacles or their fake tentacles during the day, which look just like harmless algae to attract potential prey to come in and hide. And then at night, it extends its regular longer tentacles to grab food as it passes nearby. Another anemone, Phyllodiscus semini, has a very similar behavior, 
but masquerades as a piece of harmless coral to be attractive to small animals to hide in. But the warm water isn't the only place that we find sea anemones. In fact, we find more species of sea anemones in the cooler waters of the north and the south. If you've ever been to New England or California, you might be familiar with rocky tide pools that exist along the shoreline or in small little caves. These are actually fantastic places to find tiny sea anemones hiding within the crevices, like these plumose sea anemones that we found in Maine. Or you might get lucky and find some slightly larger anemones hiding underneath the sand in these same tide pools, like these Anthopleura in Japan. These only give away their location by their tips of their tentacles showing up above the sand. We can also find anemones on buoys in the harbor or in other man-made structures like docks in what is called fouling communities. So much of my field work actually involves me hanging over the sides of docks with my hands in the cold, cold water picking anemones off of these structures. But we can find even more sea anemones a bit deeper when we go scuba diving. My work has taken me up to the Arctic up in Svalbard, where I dove in fairly shallow water to find a beautiful burrowing sea anemone, Halcampa arctica, that lives in sand and looks like a field of small flowers on the bottom. Meg and I have also gone to Ireland, which is usually known for the rolling green hills and sheep, but it actually has an amazing diversity of sea anemones to find while scuba diving. These anemones looked exactly like fried eggs underwater, but they're actually a color variation of the white striped anemone. Then, there were plenty of these snake locks anemones that moved gracefully with the current. I've mostly focused on sea anemones in the northern hemisphere, but the southern hemisphere also has a lot of sea anemones, which we are also researching. However, we still don't have a good understanding of what species live in the cold waters there. In the Falkland Islands, for example, there is an array of colorful sea anemones like this bright orange Stomphia coccinea, or this large Actinostola, that one, though, packs a punch with its venom if you touch it with bare hands. Some of them look more like flowers with short tentacles and have wavy edges like this Antheloba achetes. The earliest studies of sea anemones for, were from shallow nearshore habitats, but those aren't the only places anemones live. In fact, as we've studied sea anemones, we've learned that they live every place, or every place salty and wet. Collections from the Marianas Trench, which is in the Pacific Ocean near Guam, and contains the deepest part of the ocean, includes several different kinds of anemones. Sea anemones are among the only species recorded from the North Pole, and at the South Pole, sea anemones are everywhere, including places where we didn't think any animals lived, like burrowed inside the ice that overlays the Ross Sea. Most of the ocean is a habitat we call the abyssal plain. The abyssal plain is flat, like our Great Plains, with muddy sand. There's no grass or trees. In fact, it is completely dark at the bottom of the ocean and is probably the least densely inhabited place on Earth. It's easy to forget this because when we see images of the deep sea, the photos are taken with the lights on and many animals swarm to the light. But this habitat is totally dark and cold and the only source of food is what we call marine snow, the tiny soft remains of the organisms living in the miles of water overhead. Anemones are among the few kinds of animals that thrive in this place. Because they don't move much, they don't need much food or energy. Many anemones in the deep sea have especially large food gathering surfaces to maximize the amount of food they capture at any one time. These are called flytrap anemones because their wide oral discs passively capture snow that can snap close on larger prey when that's available. Other sea anemones maximize food capture by having lots and lots of tentacles for grabbing prey. This is Relicanthus, one of the largest sea anemones. The span of its tentacles can be greater than six feet. I first saw this animal when I went on a research trip to the East Pacific Ocean 15 years ago. We collected it during a dive with the manned submersible Alvin. If the abyssal plain is like a desert with extreme conditions and a low density of organisms, then whale falls are an oasis. Whale falls are exactly what they sound like, a whale that has died and fallen to the bottom of the ocean. As soon as this happens, fish, octopus, sea cucumbers, and crabs swarm the skeleton. These animals are all messy eaters, and their mess creates feeding opportunities for sea anemones called lipanema, also known as the pom-pom anemone, which literally roll up to a whale fall 
to scavenge food shredded by the carnivores. In addition to providing lots and lots of food for deep sea animals, a whale fault provides a place for larvae to settle. Sea anemones that need to live attached to hard surfaces float in the current as larvae and sense the presence of substrate. They'll stick onto the bones and start to develop into adult sea anemones. At least some species of sea anemone found on whale skeletons, like these Osteactus, are known only from this unusual habitat. It may be that these animals live in other places and we haven't looked hard enough to find them elsewhere. Less than 10% of the ocean floor has been studied. The opportunity for habitat provided by whale falls is also provided by something more familiar, shipwrecks. Sunken ships are important for sea anemones as habitat, especially in offshore areas where rocks are scarce. Many different species may happen upon the same shipwreck as larvae and turn it into a virtual sea anemone nursery. Shipwrecks may act as key habitat bridges for species, and provide offshore refuges for species when climate or habitat changes closer to land. From the perspective of my research, I am particularly interested in looking at a very common sea anemone in the cold water of the Northern Hemisphere, the Plumo sea anemone, to see how past geological and environmental events have allowed this anemone to move into the Atlantic from the Pacific a long time ago and what happened once it was isolated there. This sea anemone is one of the species that really likes living on the sunken shipwrecks that Meg was talking about. Uh, which influences connectivity between its populations. The neat thing about this anemone as well is that it can be moved by ships and fishing gear, so it has showed up in some strange spots in the southern hemisphere as well, places like Chile, the Falkland Islands, and South Africa. Using their DNA, we can find out how they moved around, whether by humans or naturally by matching it up with geological events. Since sea anemones are found nearly everywhere in the ocean and have fascinating relationships with different species as well as objects, we have a multitude of questions that we can ask about where they live, move, and evolve for our research. We haven't even discovered all the species yet. And there's so much more that we are still finding out about these fascinating creatures. Thank you for watching Exploring the Oceans. I hope you learned something new about one of Earth's oldest animals, the sea anemone. Don't forget to check out the ebooks from the Grandview Heights Public Library. You can find the links in the video description. If you liked this video, please like it and share. You can also subscribe and get notifications every time a new spectacular specimen video is posted. We'll see you next time where we're going to learn more about bugs.